A Life of Smoke and Silvered Glass, a Harry Potter fanfiction written by E. J. Lomax, an archive of our own, as Dirge Without Music. Part 2 of 6, read by Grant Goodwin. Here comes the graduate, said his mother as Severus pushed the front gate, his bag slung over his shoulder. You'd think he was coming home from the wars, Eileen. But his father came down from the front step to clap Severus's shoulder and tried to take his bag. Severus's hand tightened on the strap. Actually, I need that, he said. I'm not staying long. His father's brow was furrowing. Severus looked him in the eye, like he had with Dumbledore, like he did when he smirked at Avery's jokes. I've gotten a job, he said. An internship, Dad. Where? A sort of grassroots political movement, Severus said, and didn't choke on any of the words. Handing out flyers, going door to door. And it pays? Severus smiled. It was almost involuntary the way one corner of his mouth twisted cold and slow. Inexperience. He turned his head a fraction and saw his mother watching from the step. This is the group you've been mentioning in your letters, who Avery and Mulciber's parents work with. Her eyes were bright and proud. He could hear the pots of the kitchen clattering in the back of his head, the door slamming, her kicked curses and bitter mutters. Good, she said. I think you'll do good. And Severus's smile held and held. He let his father give him some advice, he let his mother kiss his cheek, and he lied when he said he'd write. He looked her in the eye when he'd said he'd write. Then he adjusted his bag on his shoulder and walked to Lily's house. He could have apparated. Someone might see him walking this way and realise who was at the end of it, but he needed to walk this way again, past this old elm, the swing set in the playground, the little yappy dog in the yard in front of the yellow house, and the big dog in the yard on the corner, who was always asleep under the jasmine. He knew the cracks in this concrete. He knew the sun on his shoulders. He knew Lily was at the end of this, like she had been for years. Bright hair and bright eyes, conning him into helping with chores, laying on their stomachs in her room, and scribbling in the margins of his textbooks, because he liked records, liked recordings, liked having things he could flip back to and look at when he forgot. She had stood cold in her doorway once, giving him nothing, and he had almost walked away and not come back. The magnolia tree outside of Lily's house was dropping wilting petals on the walk. He stepped over the brown husks. Lily would have kicked them and sent them scattering, for the sake of the sound of nothing else. Severus lifted his head, and there she was, hurrying down the steps and dragging him inside. Careful, you're not supposed to be here, Lily said, shutting the door behind her and drawing the kitchen curtains. Airy things, embroidered yellow and white. I wanted to say goodbye first, he said. In case. Oh, Sev, said Lily. Okay. You head out? Next week, she said. Dumbledore says Alistair Moody is going to teach us new kids some tricks, but I think it's mostly just to see what we're made of. They didn't know what they were getting into. They were 18 years old, and they thought that was grown. They had signed on for a fight, and they didn't know what the end would be. Petunia was rolling her eyes from the other side of the room, and they thought that was the worst she could ever do. Severus ate the sandwich Mrs. Evans thrust at him when she saw his skinny bones lurking in her kitchen. Lily gave him a handheld radio. Muggle airwaves, she said, so I don't think they'll be listening. I put some extra protections on it anyway, but we'll still have to be careful. She wrapped his fingers around the black plastic case. Because this isn't goodbye, okay? She squeezed her fingers over his. You'll be all right, won't you? He told her he'd be fine. He looked her in the eye when he said it. Severus apparated out to Diagon Alley to meet Avery at the Leaky Cauldron. The inside of the pub was as muggy as the summer's day he'd left outside. Clouds were beginning to claw over the blue and turn the sky overcast. It did nothing for the dull heat. Avery lifted his head from his pint and grinned when he saw Severus. Hey, Snape, he said. You ready to save the world? It started with favours. Severus got a dingy little apartment and a job stocking the back shelves of Florescu's ice cream shop. When asked, he carried unmarked packages from one place to another. He went to dark little back rooms of restaurants, or the reception halls of mansions, and listened to rhetoric he could spit out as well as any of them. He didn't meet Tom Riddle, called Voldemort, until two months in. Tom was still beautiful then, with his dark hair and long fingers, and that smile. He'd barely entered the room before Severus felt soft pressure against the walls of his mind seeking hands, and so he offered up all his discontent. Severus thought about feeling small. He thought, I know why I'm here. 
and pretended for a long, cold moment that the heart of it was hate. He didn't call his mother, but he met Dumbledore in the ice cream shop's massive freezer and passed him vials of wispy memory. He surrounded his bedroom in silencing spells eight inches deep and radioed Lily as summer turned slowly to fall. More and more of Lily's stories started to be about James. Severus remembered sitting on the school steps and listening to her talk about Petunia, arguing with teachers four times her nine-year-old size about homework and human rights violations. He hadn't heard a Toonie story in years, just caught her sideways glare and ladylike sniffs when he visited over summer vacations. He hadn't heard stories for ages, but he wasn't sure Lily ever gave up on anyone. Maybe she should, but he was grateful all the same that she didn't. He was grateful, but he was also listening to daily recountings of her adventures with James Potter, and he was trying not to be bitter. Be better, not bitter, Sev. She's happy. She's alive. Lily saw her first action a week after Severus did. Still high on adrenaline, she whispered to him until almost dawn the night after. Light and fire, the way fear balled up in her throat, how she dropped her wand but punched a death eater in his jaw. Remus had healed up her knuckles, and Alice had snogged Frank in the aftermath, and Moody had called them all infants. They were going for the prophet's editor's grandchildren, Lily said sleepily. Severus sat cross-legged on his tucked bedspread, books open around him, overbrewed tea cold where it was levitating beside his left shoulder. Susie, Lynn, and Antony, they're off in... off somewhere safe now. Good, he said. Then, did Potter tell you you'd never looked prettier than you did covered in blood and dirt and rage? Oh, you shut up, she said, and he could almost hear her blushing. He almost smiled, and he knew she could almost hear it too. He did, actually, she added. Don't. Don't say anything, or I'll... I'll tell Mum about the summer our third year, with the slugs. Don't think I won't. Severus didn't tell her about his first action. He'd come home smoky and ashen the week before, and flicked on the radio, and told her instead about the birthday party of an 86-year-old he'd glimpsed from the back of the ice cream shop that morning. They had stolen each other's dentures with Accio, cackling old grievances, and scorning each other's Sunday choices. It's true, Lily had said. Pistachio and bubblegum is a garbage combination. But what about with cookie bits on top, Severus had said, trying to pretend he wasn't slumped nearly face down on the bed, unmoving from the place he'd collapsed as soon as he walked in. Doesn't that just pull the whole thing together? Maybe if he was braver, he'd have told her about green flames. Maybe if he'd loved her less, he'd have told her about conjured fire, a stubborn muggle-born's empty childhood home, how he had stood there in the ghastly, flickering light, trying to figure out what he would have done if it hadn't been empty, if anyone had been home if they hadn't run fast enough. He had thought, as they burned timber and bedding, tables and rugs and patterned wallpaper, if I could separate Crab from the group, get him alone to stun. He had thought, if I could distract them, if I carried a pocket-sized portkey, if I'd learned how to do cloaking spells wordlessly. Then he had snatched up all those thoughts and set them to the side, and told himself, no. If none of those things worked, if they were home and we were here with fire in our hands, and there was no way to save them without betraying the mission. What would I do? What will I do? But he had told Lily instead about the way wispy old heads of white hair had been laid on bony old shoulders, the way the gang had snuck all their extra cherries into the little paper cup of the friend they knew loved them the most, and she had talked about how excited she was, how nervous, to be going into the field for the first time in just a week. They spoke at night, not every night, but many of them, Severus felt like he was drowning, some days, and Lily wasn't a lifeboat, but she was a reminder to keep treading. Three months later, his radio chirped in the middle of a chilly afternoon. He looked up from a book on portkey creation, and frowned at it. He flicked the radio on, but didn't say anything, in case it was a trap. Deviation from standard protocol. Something to be wary of. Sev, said Lily, and he frowned more. Mum died. Stroke. They weren't expecting. The funeral's on Tuesday. Sev. I can't go, he said. I know, she snapped, not unkindly. But I needed you to know. I needed... Yes, he said. I... Sorry. I'm so sorry, Lily, he said. She was wonderful, he said, and he listened to her cry on the other end of the line. Lily went to watch her mother be buried beside her father under a grey spring sky. Lily was not yet so well known that she had to go in disguise but Severus imagined her in black, pale and still and silent, 
her hands folded in her lap, and that seemed like disguise enough. Mr. Evans had died in the summer after Lily's fourth year at Hogwarts, and back then Severus had been able to hug her and hold her hand at the funeral and buy her candy bars after. He spent this day flying classified packages all over Scotland, only pausing in his routes to pry their protective spells open, note their contents, and piece their protections perfectly back together. He gave the information to Dumbledore by vial, a dozen snippets of open packages, the locations and faces of the senders and recipients. You're doing good work here, Severus, the old man said. Ice was gathering in his long beard. Severus didn't answer, didn't lift his quill from his clipboard, just continued to note down the amounts of chocolate ice cream and rainbow sorbet on the shelves. The work had to get done, and why not now? On a warm summer night, Severus and Mulciver were sent after an order informant named Elwyn Monroe, who lived at the far edge of a small wizarding village to the north. He had a vegetable garden of blossoming squash plants. They had been given the assignment late, with no time for Severus to get word to the order to spirit Monroe away. He and Mulciber grabbed some curry from the village shop, and then went through the paved streets by foot. You got no head for spice, Snape? Sweet tooth, said Severus, and Mulciber laughed all the way up the front walk. They were alone. The little house was quiet. The squash vines were blooming in the yard. They pushed their way into the front hall, and Severus drew his wand. The door clicked shut behind them. Mulciber yanked up his hood and moved forward, starting to kick in doors. Oi, Mr. Monroe! You have visitors. Avida Cadavra, Severus whispered at Mulciber's back, but his wand only sparked feeble green. His gut coiled coldly. His mouth twitched. He was here because at seven he'd fallen in love with the girl down the street. He didn't have enough hate in him. He adjusted his grip on his wand. He whispered, Petrificus Totalis. You need to get out. Away, he told the old man, who stepped into the hallway, blinking and clutching at his shirt sleeves over Mulciber's rigid form. Get to Elbus, or Minerva. You didn't see me, he said, and he realized it was true, with his hood hiding his face. Monroe vanished, and Severus hoisted up Mulciber's stiff body, and apparated out to drop him in the Atlantic. The sea spray soaked into his robes. He cast a cleaning spell over it when he hit land again, and then he limped to Avery's. The order, he gasped on Avery's doorstep. They got there first. They got Mulciber. He thought about Lily alone at a funeral imagined Mrs. Evans's kitchen going up in magic green flames, tried to will grief and rage onto his visage. Avery gripped his elbow. Those bastards, he said, and his voice shook with it. Severus met his eyes. We'll get them. But he couldn't murder every partner he got sent out with. He kept untraceable port keys in his pockets. He passed to Dumbledore wispy vials of secrets and sabotage in the ice cream shop's freezer room. He learned how to cast cloaking spells wordlessly. But sometimes, none of that mattered. Sometimes he watched. Sometimes he helped. Sometimes when he woke up from nightmares he could not begrudge whatever higher entity had sent them down, could not curse them for the way his limbs sweated and shook, for the way he limped to the toilet and vomited up the images curdling in his gut. He just knelt on his rough rug and let the shivers take him, let the bile coat his tongue. In the Order's camp, life went on. Alice married Frank Longbottom in a ten-minute civil ceremony that would have made Frank's mother disown him, if it wasn't wartime, and if she'd had more heirs. Lily was there as a witness, but not a bridesmaid. Alice hated fuss. I want to see you, said Lily, over the radio on a frigid Friday. It was almost summer again, but the weather hadn't seemed to notice. I know it's hard to get away, and hard to get away safely, but I haven't seen you in over a year. It's dangerous, said Severus. Why now, Lils? There's something I want to tell you, she said, and he knew she was chewing on her fingernails, the way she kept saying she'd outgrown. Then tell me. No, I want to see you. I want to know you're okay. Okay in general, and okay with this. Your face is going to do a thing, and I want to see it. Severus wasn't sure his face had done a thing in years. He lifted his eyebrows in one corner of his mouth, like at one of Avery's jokes, as though in query. The mould on his ceiling didn't seem impressed. Tell me anyway, he said. It's my news, Sev. Are you getting a tattoo of Potter's face on your bicep? Sev. You've signed me up for pottery classes with Petunia. McGonagall has formally adopted you. Black has been turned into a giant canary, and you need me to brew up a potion to turn him back. Joke's on you. I won't do it. Oh no, wait. He'd be terrifying as a giant canary. 
I will make you a shrinking potion, but that's all. I'm getting married, said Lily. Severus took a pause in both hands, held on to it, breathed into it. To Remus, he said. To James, you dishrag, she sighed, the sound rough through the speaker. You're my best friend, she said. I wish you could be there for it. Severus watched the tendrils of mould creeping across the ceiling. I miss you, Sev. Yeah, he said. Come visit. Be as paranoid and careful as you want, but come. Severus took a route that went through six European countries and one North African, used two brooms, a port key, a couple hops of apparition, and four cloaking spells. He finally stumbled to a stop under a street light in North London, drowning in a ratty sweater and baggy muggle jeans, his hair tied back under an ugly knit cap. He wiggled his toes in his boots for a long moment before taking the steps two at a time and knocking. When the door opened, Lily was standing there. So you weren't done growing, he said, because she was a bare inch taller, and she reached out and dragged him into the house and into a hug. He hoped one of them had had the sense to shut the door behind him, maybe toss up a few shielding spells, but he didn't care and didn't check. He just buried his face in the top of Lily's sunshine hair and screwed his eyes shut. You, she said, you're really here. You asked me to come, he said, and she pulled back and smiled at him. Her hair was longer, braided over one shoulder. She looked tired, with hollower cheeks and dark circles and bright eyes. I missed you, she said. Her voice was different in person, and he'd almost forgotten. You said. You missed me too, you dork. Now come on. Lily had her hand tight around his as she dragged him up to the attic, and he watched the place his sallow skin met her freckled fingers. She squeezed her grip once more as she pulled him up the last step, and into a cluttered room done up with cloaking spells so thick that even Severus relaxed a little. A young man stood up from a bare crate, shoving through his hair with one hand and giving an awkward half-wave with the other. James, Lily said, smiling ear to ear. This is Severus. Sev, James. We know each other, said Severus. You don't, though, said Lily. She sat down, then hopped up to shove Severus gently into another chair. Severus shifted his weight on the old chair experimentally, listening to the squeak of wood and screws. He looked up after a wordless moment to find Lily staring at him with pained intensity. You look like a skeleton, Sev. This is awful, Lily burst out. She leapt up again. I eat, he said. I do fine, Lily. I'm getting tea, and I'm getting bread, and I'm getting jam, said Lily. She fled toward the attic door. The moment Lily ducked out of the attic, James turned to him with a gaze so earnest that Severus gripped the edge of his chair and glared back. I was a dick to you in Hogwarts, James said. Um, said Severus, and then frowned at himself. He detested filler words, but maybe this was a special occasion. I'm sorry, said James. You've got perfect right to hate me, but I'd like it if we could be friends. Severus gripped his chair harder. He considered this. James, was the sky purple? Were all the pig-flying spells all over England, failing for one shining moment? Was his mother's basement freezing over? Waited for him to find his words. It would make certain things simpler, Severus managed. James grinned, cheeks creasing, and Severus had forgotten he was handsome. It was frustrating. Lily has made it extremely clear that no matter what I think of you, or you think of me, that you're not going anywhere without her. I go a lot of places without her these days. That's not what I... James sighed, scrubbing a hand over his face. You're important to her, and I love her so much. You were there for her, mostly, when I was a raging dick, and I was a raging dick to you. And you were a raging dick too, but... Stop groveling, said Severus. He would have liked to have interrupted earlier, but it still took a while to get his thoughts in order. You're bad at it. James stopped and blinked at him with those dumb, pretty eyes. What colour was that even? What right had it to look warm? I've been hearing about you for years now, said Severus. And anyway, I trust Lily's judgment. You don't have to prove anything. You don't have to apologize. But I want to, said James. And oh lord, the earnestness was making Severus itchy. I don't like who I was. I don't like who I'd have grown up to be. He hesitated. And I think you understand that, better than most. Severus's cheeks were lifting just softly, and he wondered why he felt like crying before he realized. No. This was just a smile, tucked away in this dark attic. He creaked the chair back and forth for a second, and then he said, It's hard to survive Lily and not end up better for it. James laughed and Severus's eyes flicked up to him, startled. 
Yeah, he said. I bet someone could resist it. But God, I'm glad I'm not him. Lily clomped up the last of the steps, the tea balanced precariously on an old cutting board. She had three pots of jam, and she set them down before Severus, like a challenge. Hey, boys, she said. What you talking about? Your fiancé's hair is stupid, Severus told her. They spent the whole rest of the day and night cooped up there, but James and Lily had patrols to run, and weddings to headline in, and Severus had some sort of heinous appointment with Igor Karkarov, and a Gringotts vault of ugly, heirloom curses. He also had a list of spells twelve inches long that might just be able to turn their break in pear-shaped, or a list that would have been twelve inches long, had his life been so blessed that he could write such things down ever. I'm happy for you, he said, before he left. Severus didn't look Lily in the eyes when he said it, just squeezed her hands in his, because he meant it. She squeezed back. He wrapped her up in his arms, and she buried her nose in his shoulder. I'm so happy for you, he said. Me too, she said, and pulled back sliding her hands down his arms to grip his hands again. Take care of yourself, Sev. She kissed him on one cheek, and he tried not to blush about it. And this still isn't goodbye. Lily Evans married James Potter under a bespelled blue sky. Petunia did not attend, and neither did Severus. Lily's father walked her down no aisles, but Hagrid brought giant, beautiful squash blossoms from his garden for her bouquet. Alice, now Longbottom, painted up her eyelashes, while Remus worked patiently on her nails. Sirius, Peter and James passed around a flask of whiskey Sirius had stolen from his father's best stores. While Severus distracted Karkarov with talk of Quidditch prospects, and tugged and tweaked and amplified and cloaked the guard spells on a Gringotts vault, the girl down the street became Lily Evans Potter. She kissed James to the sound of cheers and catcalls. Almost everybody she loved was watching her laugh, watching James pick her up, and swing her around, and crush her into a hug that involved only happy crying. James asked McGonagall how she could manage to look disapproving, even on his wedding day, grinning ear to ear. Albus wiped his tears with his long white beard. Alice romped around the dance floor with Lily, both of them smiling furiously, almost flying, impossible to catch. Mad-Eye Moody gave a speech, only stopping twice during it to throw friendly hexes at any of his cadets he didn't think were being vigilant enough. He called Lily a reckless, hellion child, and he called James damn lucky. Severus collapsed into bed at four the next morning, the tips of his hair singed with dragon flame, and his throat sore with unspoken spells. If Lily had pinged his radio for a congratulations or a hello or a goodbye, he hadn't been around to hear it. There were few things Severus didn't give to Voldemort. He gave him waking nights and ugly mornings, the power behind his wand and his hands and his mind. When he felt that gentle, invisible pressure along his temples, he gave himself, small and bug-like under his childhood covers, the banging of pots, the thump of a boot, and his father screaming at his mother. He gave himself in makeshift labs out in the forest, the gouges deep into the tree bark, the hot joy of something new dug out of his chest and made real. He gave him the transfigured flowers in his hands at seven years old, half a chocolate bar on schoolhouse steps the way ugly words had boiled in his throat on his bruising knees in a green Hogwarts quad, but not sitting with James in peaceable dark, talking about surviving Lily Evans. The more Severus gave, the less Voldemort would search. Severus had told Albus Dumbledore once that he wouldn't look out of place here, and he didn't. He understood how someone could believe in this garbage, could feel at home here, but he had given himself better things to hold on to. When he overheard Dumbledore's interview in the Three Broomsticks with Sybil Trelawney, he gave Voldemort that too. He didn't give him the vials of wispy memory in his pockets that he meant for Dumbledore, but he gave him the rest of it, spotting Albus in the streets cluttered with autumn leaves, following him quiet as a shadow, dropping in a nearby booth to hide behind a mug, ghosting up the stairs to lurk. He didn't realise. Severus was used to Lily being one of the pillars of his world, the heart of his orbit, the voice in his ear. Maybe he should have known her story would change the whole world, not just his own. But he heard a prophecy through a locked door, power he knew not, things thrice defied, and he didn't think, oh God, it's Lillian James, until too late. Albus figured it out in his second listen-through of the prophecy, holding an empty vial in Fortescue's ice cream shop's freezer room, but he didn't tell Severus. In this world, he needed to tempt Severus into nothing, not yet. This would only complicate things and Elbus was outgrowing any need for hesitation here. 
Lily radioed on a tepid Thursday night and told Severus she and James were pregnant. Severus had a few moments of only somewhat complicated joy before his heart turned to lead and dropped down to pool in his toes. When are you due, said Severus, and he was still smiling because this was good news. The end of July, said Lily, and everything in Severus's body turned into a static buzz. I, he said, as the seven month dies, Lily, thrice defied, Lily, he's going to come after you. He's going to. There's a. I didn't. I didn't know. Oh God, he thought. Oh God, it's James and Lily. I didn't think, said Severus, and he almost choked on it. He hadn't thought. Yes. Where had his pauses vanished to? I know, said Lily. We know. We're going into hiding. Elbus found a prophecy. There's something special about our kid, or there could be. Him, or Alice's boy. Alice had a boy, said Severus dull, numb, leaving me out of all the gossip, Lil. She gave a wet little laugh. Neville, his name's going to be Neville, and he's not here yet, replacing bets on Frank fainting in the hospital, and Remus is knitting him a baby blanket. You're going into hiding, Severus said, still dull, still numb, still bursting. Neville, that's a nice name. I can't tell you where. We're getting a secret keeper. There was a rustle, like Lily was rolling over. I wanted it to be you but Elbus says you're under too much pressure and too much surveillance, so we're asking Sirius. Lily, I'm the one who told him. Lily, I gave him the prophecy. Severus's breaths were caught in his staticky chest, his lungs were wet paper bags, and his hands were shaking. I know. Her voice floated through, distant and warbling, as though through water or sludge. That's your job right now, Sev. It's okay. That's what you're supposed to do. You can't get caught, okay? You can't. You can't, he said. You can't, okay? You can't, Lily. Flickering green flames were burning up the Evans family kitchen in his mind, the yellow and white curtains burning and blackening, even though Severus knew Lily hadn't been there in months. They'd boarded it up and put it on the market. Hey, um, this is James. Lily's crying. Ow, Lil's. I mean, uh, she's having emotions, but in like a really manly way. Ow, okay. A very ladylike way? And Snape, dude. I think you're having a panic attack, so I thought I'd help out with this talking bit. Everyone? Breathe? Oh, fucking shut up, Potter, wheezed Severus. You're not comforting. You're a peacock cursed with human speech. It's going to be all right, James went on. Sirius is going to brag forever that we love him best, but don't worry. We love you all equally. Go fly into a tree. I have never flown into a tree in my life, James said. And if Lily has been telling you otherwise, well... She's a dirty liar trying to turn you against me. Not going to be hard to do. Severus shoved his forehead against the radio's blocky side, trying to force air in and out of his chest cavity. Lies, said James as Severus dropped a hand against the thick weave of his bedspread, willing the pattern into the dark skin of his palm. You sent me a hat. It wasn't marked, but I know it was you. It matches Lily's eyes. That was because your hair is stupid, you incorrigible bastard, and should be hidden from innocent eyes. Severus pushed himself up to shaky feet and went for a glass of water. He pressed the heel of one palm into the rickety counter and put the radio down next to it. He could feel his heart beat in his fingertips. It's going to be all right, James said. But what if it's not? Severus took a long drink of water and only got a little down his shirt front. We're going to fight with everything we've got, and you know it, Lily said, rasping on it a little. James better be fetching her a glass of water at that very moment. He probably was, the considerate ass. Sev, I don't want to talk about this. I want to talk about happy things. Sev, I'm going to have a baby. Yeah, said Severus. He scrubbed at a cheek, scowling when he found it damp. You are, Lils. He padded back to sit on his bed. He didn't own any other place to sit. I hope it looks like you, and not your ugly husband. Me too, said James. Here, Lily, you should hydrate. Three weeks later, Severus came home to his landlord fighting off the biggest tawny owl he'd ever seen in his life. There was a lot of hooting and hollering from each of the respective individuals, and Severus said something he was trying to pretend wasn't a migraine. Excuse me, he said, and the landlord stumbled back from the bird. Mr. Snape, he pushed his glasses back up his sweaty nose. I was just trying to move this down to my office for safekeeping, but this monster attacked me. The owl had dropped back down to perch on a large package wrapped in brown paper where it was now grooming itself with off-handed arrogance. The package was tied in twine. 
Severus squinted at the thick scrawl of handwriting in the centre of it, which read, Slimy Git. Yes, he said, I believe that's mine. Thanks, sir, if you'll excuse me. He approached the package warily once the landlord had left, but the owl hopped peaceably off of it, and then followed Severus into the flat. He dug around in his cabinets for some old dry cereal the owl accepted dubiously, and then sat down to open the package. He could feel the protective spells recognising him, peeling away softly to let him in. This is an old hand-me-down of mine, read the note strewn on top of soft silver folds of what seemed to be a cloak. Figured the missus and I wouldn't have much use of it for a bit, but you might. Severus slipped his fingers under the silky fabric and watched them vanish. Of course James had an invisibility cloak at school, he told the tawny owl. She nibbled serenely on her cereal. Of course he did. The cloak wouldn't take an illusion spell when he tried one, the magic sluicing off silkily, which was rather suspicious in terms of how much of a spoiled git Potter must be. Old hand-me-down, like a goddamn ragged sweater, he said, and then jerked away at a sudden tug at his shirt sleeve. The culprit hooted at him with soft disapproval, and went back to nibbling on the loose thread at his cuff. Severus put his wand down. He put the cloak in the bottom of his bag, below his portkeys and his everyday potions, some for lying, some for hiding, some for transformation, some for healing, some for truth, some for mercy. The owl hung around, so he started picking up mice from the emporium, and fruit from the grocers, and leaving his window open for her at night. It was the end of summer. Severus sweated through the worst nights, and shivered through others. Guess what? Lily's voice came over the radio on a Wednesday, that had felt about three weeks too long. Severus might burn the robes he'd been wearing, might lay down in bed and never get up. But Lily's voice was half a shriek, and half a whisper, and he lifted his head to hear it better. I've got a kid! He's eight pounds and he screams like a hellbeast, and I am never doing this again. I already know for sure. That was wretched. Lils, Severus said, and that's all he could do. His mouth was thick and his chest was so full he could barely fit any air in. If she'd been there, he'd have hugged her so tight. If she'd have been there, he might have cried on her, and she'd have laughed at him. But he's perfect, Sev. My son. Recalling him, Harry. Tell me everything, Severus said, and Lily did her best. You're his godfather, you know, on my side, Lily whispered through the radio near the end of the call. Harry was sleeping on her chest, she'd said, and Severus laid back on his bedspread and tried to imagine it. Her long red hair, the purple bags under her eyes, and a tiny dark head cupped under her slender palm and its freckled back. Sirius is his on James's. Oh, shush, don't you say a word. You'll have to share. Or compete and spoil Harry Rotten. I don't mind. I'll keep him humble. Like you could teach humility to a mouse, Severus said. You charmer, said Lily. Oh shit, I think he's hungry. I'll talk to you later. Severus felt like he was just waiting for it, all those weeks before it happened, trying to convince the tawny owl not to rip off Bellatrix's fingers when she reached for one of his letters, and he was just waiting to hear they'd found the potters, whispering to Lily over the radio, trying not to wake the baby, and he was wondering if this would be the last time he talked to her walking back from Avery's, and he was scanning all the newspaper headlines for the news. Family of three found dead. Ex-head girl and head boy of Gryffindor, killed by Dark Lord. Have you heard, said Bellatrix, reclining into the plush seat back in Lucius's third best sitting room? Big night last night. Have you heard, Lily said over the radio that evening, and Severus almost collapsed with relief to hear her distorted voice, even though he'd known by then that it wasn't her. It's terrible news. Bellatrix's hair was a mad cloud, but unlike most of the other Death Eaters, Snape knew how long it took her to get it to that perfect chaotic mess. She stretched, her spine curving, her smile curving. Rodolphus and I and little Crouchy the Crotchety Jr. made a visit to the Longbottoms. Sanctimonious fox. You remember them from school, Snape? We got there, but not in time, Lily whispered. It was terrible. There wasn't any blood, because Cruciatus isn't like that, you know. It's not but we could hear them screaming. I could hear Alice just screaming. They had a cute little hideaway spell up, but you know how baby Barty is with those. They haven't woken up, Lily said. Neville's with his grandmother, in hiding, thank God. They're in St. Mungo's, and they say they might not wake up, or if they do, they might not ever. Not ever. Frankie tried to get between us and her, of course, and Bellatrix sniggered. I told him to wait his turn. It's Alice, said Lily, and Frank... I don't even know how to. She was crying. James was in the background, voice indistinct. 
Severus laid on his bedspread and stared up at the mould on the ceiling. He would sleep tonight, eventually, but not for a very long time. Should have seen her little weasel face when Rodolphus grabbed her by the hair. Bellatrix shook out her hair, grinning up at the ceiling. God, I'm going to marry that man. I'm sure you'll be very happy, said Severus. Excuse me, Bella, but I have actual work to do. Wet blanket, she called after him. Severus finished everything that had been asked of him, from Voldemort, Avery, Lucius and his dumb, posh voice. He bought a mouse for the tawny owl. He met with Dumbledore in the freezer room and passed him clinking handfuls of vials. I marked a few in blue I think are urgent, he said. Then he climbed the steps into his room, dropped the mouse on the counter, and fell into bed. His radio made a short, sharp sound, and after a long moment he reached out to flick it on. Have you heard, said Lily? It's terrible news. He closed his eyes. Severus was waiting for it, and then it came. Guess what, said Bellatrix, draping herself over the counter, like she was some kind of hanging moss with too great an affinity for eye makeup. End of part two of six. This has been a reading of a fan fiction creation by E. Jade Lomax, with music by Maiden. <laughs>